Okay, so I had this big fancy intro written up, but I figured at a certain point, I just needed to spit this out. because I have something I, I kind of have to confess. I've spent the last few months uh, reading about and researching and thinking about polar bears. Now, don't click off because I, I see what you're thinking there. You're like, Teddy, look, I'm, I'm not the kind of guy to spend 15 minutes thinking about polar bears. But look, that was me too, a few months ago. I thought this was gonna be like a simple video, like a, a softball video essay based around one simple question. Why is the polar bear in particular the mascot for climate change, right? You go to a climate protest, polar bears. See a headline about climate change, what do you see? Polar bears. It's not seals, it's not walruses, and it's not, you know, the indigenous people who actually live there. It's always polar bears. I'd argue that polar bears don't mean anything but climate change. If you see a polar bear, then people often think, you know, or almost always think actually, the polar bear is standing in for an argument about climate change. That is Dr. Saffron O'Neill, a professor specializing in climate change visuals and someone who I spoke with for this project alongside two other people who are way smarter than me on this topic, but they don't have After Effects. So I'm the guy who gets to make the video. This is how I, I weasel my way into the academic world. Basically, the more questions I asked about polar bears, the deeper layers I found to the story. On one level, it's a story of the transformation of the polar bear in popular imagination. How polar bears were first thought of as fierce enemies and then converted into kind of cute victims and then climate change superstars. And now they're at the center of this kind of culture war. But on an even deeper level, this is a story about how humans have learned to understand our role differently on this earth. Where do we fit in here? So with no further ado, let's talk polar bears. So why did the polar bear become the mascot for climate change? Well, the answer might seem obvious. It's cute, right? The polar bear is evolutionarily equipped with itty bitty paws, a tiny whiny whittle tail, and a face so cute I wanna die. But the polar bear has not always been seen as endearing. In fact, for a long time in the West, it was seen almost exclusively as a bloodthirsty predator. It all started because the British Navy was bored. Following the wars with Napoleon, Great Britain had lots of soldiers, but no wars to fight. So they did what any normal person would do when they have nothing to do, try to find a Northwest passage to the Americas. So began three decades of intense Arctic exploration, seen less as scientific inquiry and more as a big flex. Because after all, what's a bigger feat of bravery than to go and conquer the unconquerable. And the Arctic was seen as just that, exotic, barren, impenetrable, and unlivable, which is easy to do when you ignore, exclude, and exotify the indigenous people who live in the Arctic. These expeditions started strong, but then something shocking happened. On May 19th, 1855, Sir John Franklin and his crew of 128 set out on one of these mythical Arctic expeditions. Months passed then years with no word from Franklin or his ship. The UK soon started to realize something had gone terribly wrong. Franklin's mysterious disappearance got international attention and the US even pitched in with some rescue expeditions. It was the world's biggest game of hide and seek and Franklin was winning. <laughs> Can I say that? I feel like uh, Sir John Franklin stands are gonna come out of the woodworks to cancel me on British naval Twitter. Anyways, this search was a turning point in the public perception of the Arctic, sparking a morbid curiosity in Americans and British alike. Franklin's doomed expedition was memorialized in one of the most famous depictions of the Arctic at the time, the painting, Man Proposes, God Disposes, which features none other than the polar bear. The polar bear became this symbol for the brutality of the Arctic. In some ways it makes sense since the word Arctic comes from the Greek word arctos, meaning Bear. Surveyors would write down their diaries about how savage and powerful these beasts were. And if they were lucky, they would grab a polar bear pelt to bring home as a sort of trophy. 19th century Americans, they would have thought of themselves as very separate from the animals, right? That they are of a higher order than animals. And so the visual depictions that we see of polar bears from that time really demonstrate that, right? They're horrible monsters that serve as sort of a foil to humanity. But this image of the fierce polar bear already began to wear off by the end of the 19th century. You get the theory of evolution and maps of the Arctic and new technologies and boom, the polar bear seems less like an otherworldly beast and more kind of like an evolutionary opponent. I think it's hard for us today to understand just how monumental Darwin's work was. It ran completely counter to how people understood themselves within the world. You have this lowering of mankind, this sort of equalizing of man and beast. Polar bear hunting was seen kind of like ripping out the weeds. The same mindset was applied across the US with 
all sorts of animals. Like predators were seen as pests at best and at worst, rivals of humanity at the frontier. The US sponsored these mass exterminations of predators because in their own words, large predatory mammals, destructive of livestock and game, no longer have a place in our advancing civilization. But something weird and unexpected started to happen at the turn of the century. Kids no longer wanted to cuddle with their favorite dolls, no. Now they wanted to cozy up next to a bloodthirsty predator. The teddy bear entered the mass toy market in 1903 and took it by storm. The toy's popularity was in no small part due to the legend behind it. As the story goes, President Theodore Roosevelt was out with the boys hunting in Mississippi when said boys presented him with the sweetest gift you can get any man, a starving, bloody bear tied to a tree. But Teddy took one look at the poor thing and decided to spare the bear. And by spare, I mean they slit the bear's throat to put it out of its misery. Although we, uh... We don't normally talk about that part. This sparked the meteoric rise of the plush teddy bear, but this wasn't normal. Bears are man's competitor, but now they're also toy of the year. So what changed? Well, the teddy bear represented a new way of thinking about animals. The further away we lived from predators and the better we got at exterminating them, the more we began to see them as a victim. Author John Mualem puts it nicely. That one black bear tied to a tree outside Smeeds symbolized the predicament of all bears. The animals now lived or died according to our wants and whims. This was part of a whole cultural movement which made animals seem more friendly and docile. We start to see the polar bear lose its teeth, so to speak, um, as the 20th century goes. With the, the rise of industrialization comes the rise of consumerism, right? And we start to see the bear emerge as a trade character. Just look at Goldilocks and the Three Bears in the 19th century versus the 1930s. <laughs> But the polar bear wouldn't reach full adorable status until after World War II. New post-war weapons and transportation meant you could hunt polar bears without even setting foot on ice. As a result, polar bear hunting increased like crazy and the population began to plummet. Now it was the polar bear who was tied up to the proverbial tree in need of some teddy bear treatment. But instead of just a cute little plush, the polar bear got a media makeover. Scientific publications now showed polar bears being tranquilized, tagged by Arctic scientists. Instead of blood thirsty, they were shown as weak, dependent on humans for their own well-being. To quote a National Geographic caption, helpless as a toy, half a ton of flesh and fur swings from a boom. How our relationship with the environment has completely changed in 150 years. In the early 20th century, like the land was there for our greatness. It was manifest destiny, right? Like that idea was still very pervasive. We have completely flipped that now. We see ourselves as stewards of the environment. It parallels with the bear's flip. The media was reflecting this new role that humans had as stewards to the animals, in charge of their protection. And the polar bear would start becoming not only cute, but a symbol of ecological fragility. This is why you see all these cute and fluffy polar bears from the 80s and 90s. The polar bear had found its charm and soon it'd be ready for its biggest role yet. By the early 2000s, everyone was talking about the certainty of climate change, except for, well, the people who could actually do anything about it. The Bush administration was staying mysteriously silent on the whole topic, kind of ignoring that there was a debate to be had in the first place. So two lawyers from the Center for Biological Diversity hatched a plan, a pretty clever one too. They would force the Bush administration to acknowledge climate change through this kind of like odd backdoor strategy using the Endangered Species Act. Basically, if they could get the government to put an animal on that list specifically because of climate change, then the government would be kind of forced to A, recognize that climate change is a thing, and B, act on it to protect that species. Now all they needed was an animal in danger from climate change, a face to lead the movement, and they knew just the one. The kits, the, the Kitsilitz's Merlet. You know, everyone's favorite speckled Alaskan seabird. So the lawyers prepped the case, sent it off to the government, and were promptly shrugged off. In part because nobody really cares about the Kitsilitz as a merlet. It wasn't the mascot for any big soda brands, it wasn't the star of any movies, and more basic than that, it didn't even really look like us. Empathy is a scarce resource, and this bird simply did not have what it takes to be America's next top megafauna. So they needed a new face for the movement, an animal that was so irresistible that nobody could say no. Luckily, there was already an animal that had been transformed, mighty to vulnerable, from enemy to friend. 
So they sent in a new case, this time for the polar bear. Now there were very different results. Soon the polar bear would be on the front page of the MSNBC website. Concerned citizens, mostly children, sent in over half a million letters pleading with the Secretary of the Interior to save the polar bears. In the words of one of these lawyers, no politician wants to tell their kids, tell their constituency. Yes, I voted to kill the polar bear. But this media frenzy didn't really come out of nowhere. Dr. Dorothea Bourne researched the depictions of the polar bear in National Geographic and found that for years in the early 2000s, they were kind of unintentionally priming them to be these climate change superstars. The first phase I call the anthropomorphized phase. Polar bears are displayed from very close up. Pictures focus a lot on for example, interactions between mother bears and their cubs. So it's this family idol. The bears are really then depicted from further away. It's kind of a zooming out process. First you have the polar bear, then you have the polar bear and a bit of landscape. And then you have suddenly a very small polar bear kind of lost in an Arctic landscape. The polar bear becomes more of a symbol and less of a person to identify with. But we already identify with them because of these anthropomorphic depictions that were there before. Much like rhinestones and Ben Stiller, this polar bear mania reached its peak about 2005, 2007. This is when you get Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, which has its own dog paddling polar bear. Plus the major blockbuster, The Golden Compass, had its own CGI polar bear celebrity. Zoos, which had just begun to cut down on their polar bear exhibits due to lack of interest, were starting them up again with even more vigor. The most iconic of these new bears was the baby Canute in the Berlin Zoo. On March 23rd, 2007, Canute made his first public appearance in front of 400 journalists. Soon he'd have his own blog where he writes first person posts. Canute's fame extended way past the gates of the Berlin Zoo, becoming a sort of international superstar. What many strategists or environmentalists have been able to do, the fate of, they've, they've linked the fate of the polar bear with that of mankind. The polar bear was primed to be the perfect climate change mascot, but that was the issue. It might have been too good at its job. And as we'll see over the next 10 years, the image of the polar bear began to splinter in ways that nobody could expect. In 2017, National Geographic posted this video. Underneath read the caption, this is what climate change looks like. The video went viral, soon becoming the most viewed video ever on the National Geographic's website. If we were in 2005, then the public might have been eating this up more, but we weren't. And the reactions to this video sum up pretty well our current attitudes towards the polar bears. There are three reactions I want to talk about. First, we have the polar bear skeptics. For these folks, the video was at best manipulative, at worst faked. Many wrote think pieces about the video and snapped back in the comments, claiming that it was impossible to know if the bear was actually dying because of climate change. And in some ways, the skeptics have a point. I mean, nobody can prove that this specific bear was dying specifically because of climate change. A note which the photographer herself admitted in a follow-up article to the viral video. But these polar bear skeptics often present this ambiguity as a sort of damning proof of the falsity of the whole climate change movement. This logic kind of makes sense if you've been conditioned to see polar bear as synonymous with climate change. Of course, climate skeptics have long used the polar bear as a way to attack the credibility of the movement. In fact, some have suggested that post-2007, the polar bear has been seen just as much as a parody of the movement than as its spokesperson. So the earliest examples I found of this was in about 2007, 2008, kind of parody of the polar bear. Polar bear is kind of cliche, playing on the idea of, you know, like, have we really caused climate change? What's going on here? With the polar bear as the face of the movement, many critics got caught up in criticizing the bear rather than the science. But this goes both ways too. On the other end of the spectrum, you have the polar bear stands, the fanboys. For the stands, the blame of the dying polar bear, yes, is on climate change, but even more so on these filmmakers. How could you come across a dying animal and not do anything? Never mind the fact that it's actually illegal to feed polar bears in the wild. The stands take animal conservation in a very literal sense. For them, saving a polar bear means literally picking it up and moving it to safety. This is the same logic that's gotten some organizations to propose airlifting foods to polar bears in the wild at the cost of $32,000 a day. There's no reason why we couldn't do this. 
I mean, in the words of environmentalist J. Michael Scott, I could keep polar bears in San Diego if I really wanted to, but then we would be missing the point. And getting so caught up about caring about individual polar bears, we end up not protecting polar bears as a species. Instead of questioning the polar bear suffering, as in the case of the skeptics, the stands fixate on it. They become so sympathetic to the polar bear that they care more about the icon than the climate change movement. Plus, when you get so caught up in saving the polar bear, it's easy to forget that those aren't the only things living up north. For a long time, Inuit and other indigenous groups have lived in the Arctic, and in recent years, they've become overshadowed by this polar bear craze. Inuit activist Terry Audla acknowledged this, saying, the U.S. is using the polar bear as a blunt tool to bring about climate change concerns. It is the perfect poster child. A sentiment also reflected in the words of Inuit activist Sheila Watt-Cloutier. All too often, those who are out to save the world are all too ready to sacrifice Inuit in our way of life. This leads me to our third group, the polar bear reformers. Even environmentalists started seeing just how limiting the symbol of the polar bear can be in climate change communication. As a person researching climate change visuals, I have to say I'm sometimes a bit frustrated with the way climate change is still visualized. It's not changing that much, even though a lot of scholars say that we actually need new images. What the polar bear can do is that it can raise attention or create affection. Such emotional reactions are actually not very successful to foster engagement for climate change. They leave us feeling helpless and kind of paralyzed. As far back as the 1800s, the North was thought of a place barren of life, exotic. For many, it's so distant that it's tough to care about it. The Arctic is more affected than other regions, but on the other hand, the Arctic is very far away. And so you're like, so yeah, polar bears are poor, but yeah, I'm sitting in Austria or in Madrid and this doesn't affect me. So is it time to finally cancel the polar bear? Well, if so, that's gonna be a very hard thing to do. Just look at all of these headlines that are just from the past year. The polar bear continues to be the media darling of climate change. And it's so culturally ingrained that at this point, it's hard to imagine a future where we completely dethrone the polar bear. Still, there have been some pretty convincing attempts in recent years. In 2019, the New York Times published, these days, it's not about the polar bears. And The Guardian proclaimed that it would no longer use polar bear images in its articles about climate change. The same year, climate change activist extraordinaire, Gina McCarthy stated, we have to stop talking about polar bears in the Arctic and start talking about our families and our children. And this is exactly the trend we've seen. Polar bears out, people in. I think we've seen a lot of really positive things happening over the last couple of years. I mean, if you look at, for example, the youth protest movement and the growth of, say, Greta as a climate icon and, a, and you know, a visual icon. And from we've gone from protests with, you know, massive street protests, no faces, to really zooming in on these young people, faces of hope and um, you know, really concentrating on the idea of intergenerational equity and justice. The polar bear is far from gone, but in the same way that the polar bear is no longer the mighty king of the Arctic that it was 200 years ago, it might not be the wholesome climate change advocate that many of us were hoping for. The meaning of this animal supersedes what it actually is now. It's not just a bear. It's not just a predator. It's this, this great Arctic symbol. It is a mirror of the mistakes that we have made as an industrialized society, right? It's, it's held up to us to show us the future of our own suffering. It's sort of like jumping the shark at some point, right? That, that people start to see the way that it's used to manipulate public thought. You start having to look for something new. As we move into this new phase, we seek new methods for telling the same message, that this planet is worth saving for our grandkids and our grand cubs.